Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from Solid 2015 at Fort Mason. I'm here with Niloy. Niloy, how are you doing? Good. Mike, how are you? Good. So you're a CMO at GE. Mm -hmm. In which group is in that? In the Power and Water Division, which is the largest industrial division of GE. So then the industrial internet is probably very important to you. Yeah, it's um, sort of what I would call my day job and many times my night job. Yeah, industrial internet is how GE looks at the industry um, from how we're converging the software and the hardware and what you would call it as Internet of Things. We see industrial internet really as a subset of Internet of Things, but it's also different. So Internet of Things is consumer, commercial, and industrial, but the use cases, the design elements, the type of technology, and spe specifically the type of hardware that you need in the industrial world is very different. So that's why we kind of look at the industrial internet as a subset, but definitely a, a distinct yeah, subset. It's an interesting set because you know we, we have machine to machine, we have robotics, yeah. we have manufacturing, we have industrial internet, we have internet of things, we have wearables, we have all machine to machine, all these different descriptors, right. but we can't find that one that unifies them all together. But the industrial internet, is it focused on specifically large machinery or? Yeah, I would say it starts probably easier to understand from a large machinery, but it applies to uh, buildings, it applies to lighting fixtures in your roadways, you know, how you transform cities. Uh, so its scope is big and um, our chief economist did a paper a few years ago. If you think about the economic impact of industrial internet, our projections, which is corroborated with some of the other MIT research and Cisco's own research, is in the range of 10 to 15 trillion dollars in the next two decades. So that's pretty significant. So again, naming convention aside, yeah. it suffice to say for your audience that it's big, right? And whether it's internet of big things, internet of things, you everything, know, everything, right? Uh, you know, I don't think we can still say it's uh, buzz. I don't think we should be saying that it's sort of early and it's not cross the chasm. I would say it's crossing the chasm as we speak. I can speak from it from my own personal experience in the GE. It is probably the number one uh, investment and strategy across our company right now. And so what, what is it you guys are doing with the wind turbines and the wind, wind farms yeah. and that sort of thing? Because that seems like a really classic example of the industrial internet. Absolutely. Yeah, no thanks for agreeing with us on that front. Um, we actually launched our digital wind farm um, last month at uh, AWIA, which is American Wind Energy Association. It's the largest energy association for renewable uh, energy. So if you think about what's happening in the renewable industry, wind is growing pretty well globally. It's about 4% of energy production um, going up to another you know, 8 to 8% 8 in the next five years. So it's doubling in the next five years. But it's still what I would call it organically growing um, and the technology that has been invested in it, whether it's from a hardware perspective um, or from a software perspective, has been fairly organic and, and sort of incremental. But I think with the digital wind farm, our notion is that finally we have an opportunity to really disrupt the technology space. Right? So we came out with, essentially think of it as a vision for the industry. It's got two components, a software-defined turbine mm -hmm. and an industrial digital infrastructure and how you can operate your wind farms better. So if you combine those two, our initial estimates are 20% more output uh, for a typical wind farm. That's like $100 million over the life of a 100 megawatt wind farm. Or if you aggregate it at the wind industry level, that's $50 billion of value. Um, is, so. is, is there a baseline to start out with the wind farm, like um, someone looking at latitude and longitude yeah. of where the winds are the strongest and That's right. locating the farms right. in, in the windier areas? Right. I mean, and yeah, it's, it's great that you asked the question because it's very interesting how the industry operates today. When you set up what they call wind masts across the site that you might have considered as an attractive site, and these wind masts then you essentially gather data over a six month or a 12 month period and based on the analysis of the data, you have to decide on one configuration of turbine for the whole farm. It's like you're picking up one t-shirt when you have a whole village to, to uh, give t-shirts to, give yeah. t out to. And that's mainly because you don't want to have to deal with 20 different turbine manufacturing parts and all of that stuff. So with the new digital wind farm, we're essentially now yeah. launching 20 different wind farms at the same site. 
right? You can have different hub and heights. They can be tuned. And, tuned, and, yeah. tuned. and it's really a supercomputing simulation that allows you to be able to do that mathematics. So it's a perfect example of how hardware configuration is now coming together with software. And right, so that's how do you get a much better build than you ever had before. But then we have this digital twin, which is a living big data residing on our predicts platform that then learns and, and sort of adapts to the weather pattern and other configuration, maintenance configuration real time over the life of the farm. So that's how you get 20% more, which is very significant yeah. in the industry. So you spoke about software-defined turbines, and we know software-defined radio, software-defined blah. Is this a trend, software-defined something? Yeah. Look, I think it's already a big trend in the consumer world, right? Our phones are software-defined. I mean, Apple and exactly. Android are changing the hardware configuration over the internet. It's much harder to do it in the industrial sector, but the value of being able to do software-defined machines is very significant. So it's, I would say it's early trends. Again, I'm probably biased, but GE is a leader in that space right now. And you'll see some of the technology elements that are predicts from our industrial internet platform is how we can do what we call closed loop control system. So a hardware engineer, this is you know nirvana to be able to manage a you know two gigawatt of turbine remotely, securely, and be able to get more output from that turbine. That's really powerful use case. So we're getting to that point where we can do it not just on G machines but on other equipment as well as the total plant, balance of plant as you would call it. I think everyone knows GE is you know, making great engines, making great industrial devices, but you also are a really design-oriented company. Can you speak to how important design is at GE in all, for all your products? Yeah, I think it's a personal passion for me and I can totally see how our leadership is driving that. And you really have to almost take a step back and see if you go to any power plant or any oil and gas field, the way a field engineer operates is really what I would consider in the consumer era, you know, in, back in 1960s. The human machine interface is still blue screen screens in many cases. So being able to extract the productivity from a much better design experience, whether it's the hardware or the software that they deal with on a daily basis, is humongously, is immensely powerful in terms of sort of uh, opening up doors from productivity. So with that idea in mind, we really invested a lot in our design capability. And some of the earliest you know, components of our Predix platform was the design experience aspect, because that's the easiest way to get traction with our customers, with our own field engineers and our leadership. And it has made a, it's paid for itself tremendously. And the other trend I would say is, you know, hardware engineers or engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, they're starting to become, have to become software engineers yeah. too, right? Yeah. What I call the mechanical digital engineering uh, facets are coming together. And the, one of the elements, the glue that gets those two functional elements together is going to be designed. So in the next 12 months, and, and this will be my final question, if you look forward 12 months from now and you look at the power gen industry, where will it be and where will you guys be helping it go? Yeah. Um, I'll give you the 12 months answer, but maybe what's interesting is taking a little bit of a longer view. If you see what's happening from a population standpoint, we are very soon going to be a 9 billion uh, population in this world, right? In the conservative estimates are 1.2 billion people of that 9 billion will not have power or not have affordable, sustainable power. So if you think from a power gen industry, the challenge that we're trying to solve for is at a global scale. How do you bring in affordable, sustainable, right, uh, eco-friendly power? So with that in context, the technology movement that's happening and the pace is you know, phenomenal. I think Maslow's law is starting to show up from an internet of things or industrial context in the energy space. And even just in the 12 months, what I predict is the energy digital gap, right, is how I call it. The digital gap is what is the potential of getting value out of digital technology, Internet of Things, industrial internet, software, and where it is today. I would consider energy industries actually a laggard um, in adopting and in digital. That gap is one of the highest. So from an opportunity standpoint, it's one of the best opportunities in any space, right? So I see the next 12 months, you'll see a lot of technology not just from companies like G, but startup companies starting to pick up um, the thread.
Excellent. Deloitte, we look forward to that journey. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure meeting you.